and let them have dominion. The kingdom of God is within people. It's the advancement of the people that is advancing. Because of the faith must be backed by the assignment of this ministry is found from that past. Where we You're unto a word encounter as Pastor David Ogweli ministers God's word to you with simplicity and power. God bless you. He created them to control the earth, to control the circumstances of earth, just like God controls the heavenly. Hallelujah. All the battles you are facing is over. It's over. It's over. It's over. Amen. Your mistake does not cancel your purpose. There are some very serious issues i'm sent here to resolve very serious issues for some of you it will be the harvest of some of the things you've been believing god for in risk and so on <laughs> lift up your hands father come and make yourself known to your people in a new way tear the veil this night look at me how many of you have seen jesus before how many of you have seen jesus before i have three times how many of you have seen him before let me see you I've seen a few hands, a one or two. Do you know what will happen to you if you see Christ once? To see him is to become like him. The struggles you are having with Satan ends automatically. Nothing enthrones a believer and puts him in charge of life and puts him in charge of the powers of darkness like the revelation of Jesus Christ I know that you have believed God for things before you have believed God for breakthroughs miracles and all that tonight I want you to ask for one miracle that your eyes be opened that you will see him when the Lord was sending me here he said he's going to appear to people he said he's going to reveal himself to people. Some of you, he will open the eyes of your understanding. The veils will tear. Then you will start getting a revelation of him like you have never known before. Others, he will actually open your spiritual eyes to see him. The power to become like him comes from a revelation of him. The power to do the works that he did comes when you see him as he is. The power to rule over creation. Tomorrow night, we're going to talk about the creator man. The man that functions like a god. He rules over death. He rules over the created order. But the foundation of that is the revelation of Jesus. Lift up your hands. You have seen your pastor. You have seen some of us. What do you think produced us? It's not cock and boo stories. It's not cock and boo stories. What do you think produced that? Something is going to happen to you tonight and this weekend that you will be eternally grateful for. Lift up your hands. Ask him to tear the veil for you. Ask him to remove the scales from your eyes.
Matthew chapter 18. Matthew chapter 17. You know, there is a popular story there. After six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John, his brother, and led them up to a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as the light. And behold, Moses and Elijah appeared to them talking with him. Then Peter answered and said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here to make three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and suddenly a voice came out of the crowd saying, This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. Chapter 16. The only thing that amazed me about this is that three men were selected to see what the whole Jewish nation could not see. Three men were selected to see what the whole apostles could not see. And what got me sad is that in that meeting they slept off. And they woke up when the meeting was ending. Elijah and Moses and Jesus were discussing a secret that Satan himself did not know. Of course, these three men that had this experience, let me read for you the instruction they were given when they finished. Verse 9. As they came down from the mountain, Jesus commanded them saying, Tell the vision to no man until the son of man is risen from the dead that thing he was prohibiting them from telling is what i want to tell you tonight that was the most guarded secret at that moment if satan had access to that secret jesus would not have been crucified tonight we're going to talk about the revelation of jesus christ The revelation of Jesus Christ is the most important thing you need. Is the most important revelation you can catch. Is the most transforming and life-changing revelation you will ever have. Nobody gets that revelation and not be singled out of the group. If you notice, Jesus had 12 apostles, 70 other evangelists and ministers, and then 120, and then 500. The Bible said there were about 500 of them by the time he returned back to heaven. Those were trained and well-trained disciples. Now, talk, talk less of the multitudes that followed him. But each time you turn to the book of Acts, there are three names that you hear. It is Peter, it's James, and John. What about the rest? When you talk about unusual miracles, the fourth man that was added was Paul. And what produced Paul was the same thing that produced the other three. The revelation of Jesus Christ. These were the three closest apostles that Jesus had. And yet they didn't know him. They didn't know him. 
So he takes them up to the mountain that day. They saw him transfigured. But when they started discussing the meaning of that, the implication of that, they were all asleep. Towards the ending, if you are to read it, they now woke up. In verse 7, Jesus came and touched them and said, Arise. And when they have lifted up their eyes, they saw no one but Jesus only. When you read it in Luke chapter 9, you see that they were asleep. Deep asleep. By the time they were waking up, Elijah and Moses had gone. They had missed the whole discussion. So Jesus was the only one that was transfigured. Peter missed the experience the opportunity to experience personal transfiguration. James missed it. John missed it. When Moses had this same kind of experience, he was awake for 40 days and 40 nights. When he came out of that experience, he himself, his face was shining like the man he saw. That normal human beings could not look on his face. What Moses wrote down as a result of that encounter with God for 40 days were contained in five books those five books have formed the foundation of civilization as we know it today what you call modern civilization derived their values the principles on which they were built on those five books that this man wrote It was while Moses was having that experience that he was transported back to the beginning and shown the story of the creation, the revelation of how everything happened. Mark chapter 16 Verse 13, when they came to the region of Cassere, Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Who do men say that I am, or I the Son of Man am? And of course they said, Some say you are John the Baptist, some Elijah, others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And he said to them, Who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered and said, You are the Christ the son of the living god and jesus answered and said to him blessed are you simon Bajona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you but my father which is in heaven and he said i say unto you that you are peter now uh, the word peter means rock he said for now you are a rock and he said on this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven that whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatever you lose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. It is the revelation of Jesus Christ that produces a creator man. A man that governs creation like God governs it. Is this revelation that puts the church in charge? He said, once you get this revelation, the gates of hell can't stand you. The revelation confers authority on you to cause creation to bow. The revelation puts so much authority in you that hell itself is constantly put on the run now you know i uh, uh, i want to say it this way i have noticed that there is a veil that we we deal with because we are still in the flesh each time that veil dims the light of the revelation of christ satanic dominion comes on the increase when somebody tells me satan slapped me in the night uh, i don't know what is happening the battle is so strong the enemy is waging a strong war against me. They've locked up my business. You know what is wrong? The curtain has been down. Your eyes have been blinded again to the light of the glorious gospel of Christ. I'm not talking about light of salvation. I'm talking about the light of the glory of God on the face of Jesus Christ. 
Anytime they start telling me Satan did this, Satan did that, that curtain has, has started coming down again. Each time it happens to the church, the church starts suffering defeat. What you notice is that the kingdom of darkness comes on the pursuit. The church now gets on the defense. The church is now on the defense. Why Satan and his forces are on the attack. Each time that revelation comes, Satan is now on the run. The church is now on the pursuit. You know when he said, and the gates of hell shall not prevail. What he's saying is that church is the advancing force. Hell is the one trying to see if they can hold their territory. But they can't. We knock down the gates of hell and recover what the enemy has stolen. I want to announce to you this night, everything that Satan has collected from you, every opportunity, everything he tampered with, all of them are going to come back into your hands. And, and, and do you know the amazing thing? You will see how easily you can recover it. Very easily. Very cheaply. This is the greatest fear of Satan. The church finding out who Jesus is. Because he himself found out too late. He crucified his boss. You know, I have, I have a couple of policemen, some came with us. Can you imagine one of those policemen arresting the IG because he's on Mufti? And he's on Mufti driving through LMLA Junction. And one of these men arresting and gives him, uses his gun on him. And then after carrying him to station, when you now get into station, the DP will say, hey, whoa, do you know who you brought here? That is how Satan held his head. By that time, Jesus has already died. In hell, he held his head like this. He bowed on the ground, but crying cannot, cannot save this thing. He has made the greatest blunder of his life. And since the resurrection of God, if you notice, if you have read the Bible, he sponsored the first rumor immediately. He got them to pay money, pay money to people, just to tell life that he did not write. Because his greatest problem is the day people get a revelation of the risen Christ. That finishes him in any city. Any city where this revelation comes to the church in that city, Satan packs his bag, he's trying to leave. That's why he fears us. He knows, he knows me very well. He has my number very well. When I'm entering a city, he knows that trouble has started. And he can't stop me from coming if God says to go. After this weekend, you become separated from disciples. They are disciples and they are disciples. I say they are disciples and they are disciples. You will be separated out. You will stop giving your pastor a headache. You stop disturbing him. So you can focus on other people. Because the revelation of Christ establishes you as a rock. You know, Peter, his real name was Simon. He read, shaking by the way. Very unstable. Today he's backside. Tomorrow he's lying. Uh -uh. That revelation turns you into a rock it gives you tap root and gives you foundation who do men say that I am then the question comes to you who do you say that I am like I've always said it's not what God said to us that changes your life. What revelation you have of him personally. That changes everything. As we go into the meetings. Write those words that God is speaking to you personally. Because as the words are coming. Your word. Your very remote word. Is going to come to you direct. Exodus chapter 3. This is how a creator man was formed out of a shepherd man that has been defeated, that is on the backside of the desert, had no self confidence. 
That's how God created, raised a God out of an ordinary man. What he simply did is that he gave him the revelation of I am. From that day, Moses, <laughs> Moses, Moses speaks to the sea, sea divides. Moses speaks to the cosmos. And darkness comes for three days. A human being has power to suspend the rotation of the earth. Moses speaks to rock, water comes out for people to drink. <laughs> Moses takes sand and he speaks so he throws it into the air. It turns to living things. These are the kind of things that only God can do. Like when he made man. You know God said, let the earth bring forth living creatures. Moses took the same sand, earth, and created living creatures. And flies invaded the, the, the nation of Egypt. He did it another time. It was insects. Biting insects. Lice. And they were in their millions. The same way God said, let the waters bring forth living creatures. Moses spoke to the water. Frogs. Millions of frogs invaded a whole nation. How do you produce a man like that? How do you produce men that turn water to wine? How do you produce men who live in the realm of the miraculous as if it's a natural realm? You know, we are living in that hour when the Bible says gross darkness shall cover the earth. Now, I want you to know that the power of darkness is becoming more and more manifest. These are not the days where you can be doing ordinary Christianity. Where you can be doing religion. You say, that's, that's, that's my church. I was, my father was born in it. I'm born this. Uh -uh. This is the time that the scripture spoke about that they that know their God shall be strong and do exploits. In these last days, your greatest possession will be a personal revelation of Christ. Exodus chapter 3. This is how Moses was called to go and deliver the children of Israel out of Egypt. God appeared to him in a burning bush. And he calls him when Moses came, God said, I have seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt and I am burdened about the oppression of the Egyptians on them. And then in verse 8, the Lord said, I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians to bring them from that land to a good land, a large land, to a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, and there are as many of us here carrying different visions in our hearts. Different things that God has put in you to do. Some of them are ministries. And you are wondering how to go about it. Some of them are businesses, career visions, family visions. Verse 9. Now therefore behold, the cry of the children of Israel have come to me. And I've seen the oppression where we the Egyptians oppress them. Come now, therefore, I will send you to Pharaoh that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. That was where the trouble. When God said, I have come down, Moses relaxed. Oh, you have come down to do this thing. No problem. Go ahead and do it. But the moment he said, Now I'm sending you. <laughs> come now, I will send you that you may go and bring them out. That was where Moses' problem started. Moses replied in verse 11, he said, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and that I should bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? The reason he said this is because he has tried before. When he got to the age of 40, Acts chapter 7 said he went to visit his brethren and saw an Egyptian beating one of them. He killed that Egyptian, buried him. Covered him in the sun. And then the next time he goes, he saw two Jewish people fighting. And he separated them. The scripture said, for he supposed that they should have understood that he is the one God we used to bring them out. In other words, he knew that he was their deliverer. And he was expecting them to understand. But they didn't. 
the one who was the, in the wrong, the one that was offending his brother, got up and said, Hey, who made you a judge of ours? You think the people you are sent to will always accept you? It doesn't work like that. You have to have what can compare them. Ministry is not convincing people with ordinary talk. They say, who made you a judge of ours? And the guy began to blow the whistle. Ah, you think you can kill me like you killed that Egyptian? Ah, once the guy began to talk, Moses knew that his life was in danger. And he had to flee. And he ran to save his life because Pharaoh had it and wanted him dead. He ran into the wilderness of Midian. There he met a group of girls who finally no, through them he met their father and that's how he began to serve a man. Prince of Egypt now servant. It's like from <laughs> Prince Charles to a slave in Africa. From living in Buckingham Palace to trekking around the bush with stick looking after sheep. All his ego was destroyed. All his self-esteem was destroyed. From a man that laid his bath and brush his back. From jacuzzi. From palace treatment. To the backside of the desert. And now government is looking for him for murder. He has blood on his hands. So God who are you calling? A murderer? You know I kill somebody. Me that have this uncontrollable anger. I have this problem. He used to think that he was the deliverer. After he failed, all the vision busted in his spirit. You know what they call balloon vision? Just like balloon. Forty years after, he ends up marrying one of the daughters of the man. All those his dreams in Egypt of the most beautiful girl in town that he was going to marry ended. All those dreams of the kind of wedding he was going to have ended. He ends up marrying the daughter of that shepherd man who was also a priest. And one day it was while he was there that he had this encounter. And God appears to him. Let me read something. God answered this question. He said, I will certainly be with you. This is how he answers. He deals with barriers of ministry, barriers of vision, barriers of destiny. You know, all the things you think that are your obstacle. Why I can't get married? Why nobody will like me? Why this will not happen? Why I have tried and tried? And this is all he offers him. Certainly, I will be with thee. And this shall be the sign that I have sent thee. When you have brought forth this people out of Egypt, you will worship on this mountain. Needless to say that it happened. Because one day that man who did not believe was standing on top of that Mount Sinai and he looks down. What he saw was three million people. Three million people. Covering the whole foot of the mountain. And then he tells them that the same man that appeared to me will appear to all of you. And to their shock, on the third day, God descended and the whole mountain was on smoke. And the Jewish nation, as a whole nation, heard the voice of the invisible. Who am I that I should go? And the Lord said, certainly I will be with you. Everyone say it. I will be with you. Say it. Say it. God said he will be with me. Say it. Say it. I believe that he will be with me. Now the question is, Moses said, who are you that will be with me? Is it this burning bush or what? He hasn't known, even though he knows, he knows his God, but so if you just tell me I will be with you, I will go to Egypt. I'm you want me to go and commit suicide? So, 
So Moses said to God, Okay, even if I believe you, and I go to the children of Israel and said to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you. That's verse 13. And they said to me, What is his name? Who shall I, what shall I say to them? And God said to Moses, I am who I am. He said, Thus shall you say to the children of Israel, I am has sent me to you. Everyone said that. I am has sent me. That is where my journey begins tonight. So the question now is, who is this guy called I am? Who is this person? Who is this person? Who is this person? Is he God the Father? Who is he? Is he an angel? Let me give you a secret. John chapter 1 verse 18. Look at it first. John chapter 1 verse 18. Now, this is Jesus talking. This is Jesus. Uh, this is not Pastor David. This is not a, a pastor, a evangelist, or a prophet. This is not your uncle. It's Jesus that is talking. Look at what he said. No man has seen God at any time. Underline at any time in your Bible. Underline it. No man has seen God at any time. Keep one finger on that. I want to show you something else. Exodus 33. Verse 11. Exodus 33 and verse 11. Look at it. And the Lord spake unto Moses face to face as a man speaketh to his own friend. And after this encounter, he turned again into the camp, but his servant Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, departed not out of the tabernacle. Joshua did not see what Moses saw, but he felt the glory of God. So he would sit at the door of the tabernacle, waiting for this God to finish. And he said, um, the Lord spoke to Moses face to face. Now, let me tell you the difference between this and seeing God in a dream. There is a big difference. Aaron and Miriam, who were also prophets, got up one day and said, does the Lord only speak to Moses? I can show you to you, Rob, but, you know, does the Lord only speak to Moses? Doesn't he also talk to, talk to us? So they said to Moses, how come you married that Ethiopian woman? You think you're the only one that hears from God? I told you they are prophets and they are prophets. They are disciples and they are disciples. So you know what God did? The Bible said, the Lord, the glory of God appeared. Just because somebody, his friend, as a man speaking to his friend, there are a few people the Bible calls God's friend in the Bible. Abraham was one of them. Abraham saw God with these two eyes. Not in a dream. This is another one. And so God appears. And when he appeared, he said, Aaron and Miriam, come here. But the amazing thing is that he now explains something to them. He said, when I raise a prophet, I show myself to that prophet in visions and dreams. I appear to them in the visions and in dreams when they are sleeping. Or I take them in a trance and show them some things. Give them a message. He said, but my servant Moses is different who is faithful in all my house. I don't talk with him in visions and dreams. He sees me face to face. He said, the similitude of God shall he behold. He said, why are you not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? And God's anger came 
Miriam immediately became leprous. Moses, the same Moses that we are speaking against, was one that blocked because Aaron would have joined. He blocked it and blocked it and saved Aaron. And then he started pleading for Miriam. But anyway, God said, I've, least, I've heard what you said, but at least she will remain like that for seven days. So she will learn her lesson. Take her outside the camp. On the seventh day, you people should go there. You will see that she is fine. Bring her back. Now, this is not leprosy of the finger or of the legs eating up your toes. It's total leprosy from head to toe. Now, that's why I just said that for you to know exactly that this is different from, I, 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 you know, somebody was sleeping and something. Moses does not sleep when this experience occurs. The Lord spoke to Moses face to face. Go back to John chapter 1 verse 18. No man has seen God at any time. I know that this is true because the one that is talking is the authority. He's not a prophet. He's the man. Look at what he said. The only begotten son which is in the bosom of the father he has revealed him. The only person that has seen God is me. And I'm here now to show you who he is. That's what Jesus is saying. The only person that has seen the person all of you are talking about is me. And I'm here to reveal him. Now, so anytime you see a manifestation of anything that looks like God to the point that human beings saw it, it is not God the Father. This is the person that revealed. This is the person that you have seen. Who you saw is the second person of the Trinity. The Trinity has three persons. Whenever you see the glory of God like a cloud, sometimes it will cover the camp of Israel. Whenever you see the fire of God, whenever you feel the presence of God, the person that is manifesting is the third person of the Trinity called the Holy Spirit. But any time anybody has claimed that he saw God, he saw God in a form, he saw the similitude of God, the person he saw is the second person of the Trinity. Listen very carefully. The reason you are powerless is because you don't know who Jesus is. You have reduced him to a man. You have so reduced him that sometimes... Christians make comparison between him and, and Muhammad. They make comparison between the order he founded and other religions. They think Christianity is a religion. Yes, there is Christian religion. And many of us are practicing it. And that's why you are, you are as powerless as you are. If no one has seen God at any time, then who appeared to Moses? I think I need to show you something. Turn to Exodus 33. Turn to Exodus chapter 33. Look at verse 18. This is God. Moses asking God, I beseech you, show me your glory. I want to see you. That's the question he asked God here. He said, show me yourself. Yes, verse 19. And the Lord said, I will make all my goodness pass before thee. I will proclaim the name of the Lord before thee. I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious. I will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. 20. And he said, Thou cannot see my face. Because there shall no man see me and live. A human being is asking God, I want to see you. He said, I will cause my glory to pass before you. And I will declare my nature, my goodness. But nobody can see my face and live. It's like saying to the sun, I want to touch you. It's 93 million miles away and in the afternoon, it's that hot. And you want to touch it or maybe shake hands with it. Even if son is your friend, you need to build your house at least 93 million miles away from where he lives. 
tell him not to come near. That's how it is with God. As long as you're in this mortal body, there is a boundary you cannot cross. If you are getting the message, let me see your hand. Okay. But you see, so he said, are we, and finally, in answer to what Moses did, if you want to read it down, the Bible said, and the Lord came down and stood there and talked with him. He came down. And go, go, you know, go down a little. Go down a little. Go down a little. I want you to explain, see what he told Moses. I will come down. There is a place by me that you shall stand upon a rock. Continue. And it shall come to pass while my glory is passing. I will put thee in a cleft of a rock cover thee with my hands while I pass by. Yes, continue. And I will take away my hand and you will see my back. But my face shall not be seen. So actually, Moses, if you read it in chapter 34, you see, Moses saw God's back. The question I want to ask you is, who did Moses see? John chapter 1, 18, again. Turn to it. No man has seen God at any time. On the line, you need to circle at any time. If this is true, the question is, who did Moses see? Who did Moses see? That man calls himself a he, a sha. I am that I am. He said, tell them that I am sent you. When you get a revelation of I am, and you know who it is that you are carrying inside you, the scripture talking about him said, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. When you get a revelation of I am, and you know who it is that sent you, all the controversies around your destiny ends. Genesis chapter 18. I want to show you something. God appears to Abraham and ate food in his house. God. Turn to it. Verse 1. The Lord appears to Abraham by the Tebin tree of Maya. And he was sitting in the tent door in the hot afternoon, in the heat of the day. And he lifted up his eyes and looked. Behold, three men. There were three. Everyone said, three men. He said, no man has seen God. But now here is Abraham looking at them with two eyes. In the afternoon, not in the night. They're not sleeping. That you know is that he ran inside, prepared food, brought to them, and they finished the food. God is food. And in case he comes to your house, I will show you some of the kind of menu he eats here. He lifted up his eyes, looked, behold, three men were standing by him. When he saw them, he ran from the tent door to meet them and bowed himself to the ground. And said, my Lord, if I have found favor in your sight, do not pass on by your servant. Please let a little water be brought. Wash your feet. Rest yourself under the tree. And I will bring a morsel of bread that you may refresh your heart. After that, you can continue with your journey. But they said to him, do as you have said. So Abraham hurried into the tent to Sarah and said, quickly, make ready three measures of fine meal. Make cake. Have you seen the kind of things God eats? He likes baked food. That's why in heaven they see eat bread. And Jesus was telling us that when we get there, we're going to chop heavenly bread with him and drink wine. They, God drinks wine. I don't know if you have seen it in the Bible. How many of you have seen it? Yes. God drinks wine. That's why he, cre he created vine tree. Wine is good for your health. Oh. I didn't say Ogogoro in Port Harcourt. <laughs> I 
And he said, my Lord, if I have found favor, come and eat in my house. Among the things that Abraham gave them, verse 7, he took a tender, good calf. And they killed it and dressed it. He took butter. He took milk. He took calf, which he has prepared, and set it before them. And he stood by them under the tree while they were eating. You know, some of you think in heaven, heaven is eternal fasting. Why will anybody want to go there? You think it's worship service for eternity, singing hallelujah. No, there is force in heaven. There are tr there's transportation. We're not just going to be floating because with wings. We don't have, we're not going to have wings there. Did you see one of the transport systems that Elijah took? They called it chariots of fire. Yeah, that's because they didn't know how to write it. They are, they are called unidentified flying objects. It's not this kind of aircraft tool. You say, I'm going to UK six hours. Mm -mm. You are already, you are, before you did like this, you have landed. Before you boarded, you are there. <laughs> anyway, let's leave that for another time. Okay. Then they said to him, where is Sarah your wife? So he said, here in the tent. And he said, I will certainly return to you according to the time of life. Behold, Sarah your wife will have a son. Sarah was listening in the tent door which was behind them. Now, Abraham and Sarah were old and well advanced in age. And Sarah has passed the age of childbearing. Therefore, Sarah laughed within herself, saying, after I have grown old, shall I have pleasure? Yeah, that's, can I still enjoy sex? And my Lord being also old. Anyway, she should talk for herself because men enjoy it even after being old. You notice what happened when she gave, to, gave allowed Hagar. You remember that? And not only that, after, after Sarah died, having Isaac live very old and died, instead of retiring, Abraham went and collected a third one called Keturah. And he has seven children for that woman. And the wife is saying, ah, me, that is already 90. How can I enjoy sex? You can talk for yourself, not for men. Men are a different creature. Don't try them with that kind of thing. <laughs> and the Lord said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh? I mean, the lady was laughing inside. Look at who are those visitors. Who are those people talking nonsense? He then asked the man how old I was. But the Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh? Saying, Shall I surely be a child since I'm old? Then he asked a question, Is anything too hard for the Lord? <laughs> the man that does the work is asking you, Do you think, what do you think? <laughs> is anything too hard for the Lord? And at the appointed time, I will return to you according to the time of life. Sarah shall have a son. But Sarah denied it, saying, I did not love. And you know, you know, you would think if you lie in the presence of God, he will probably kill you. He just ignored the woman. In this particular case, because the lady was carrying purpose. It, there is a different case with Ananias and Sapphira, but we will leave that for another time. Sarah denied it, saying, I did not love. For she was afraid. And he said, no, but you, you did laugh. Have you seen word of knowledge? That's how God operates himself. It's when the Holy Ghost comes, takes you over. He just operates in you, the same thing that operates in God. He just knows things, supernatural. And you know them. But anyway, you know, then the men rose from there and started moving towards Sodom. Abraham went with them to send them on their way. So you can see, I just took time to read this for you to know that this is not a vision. Abraham escorted them on their way. But notice what happened. And the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham what I'm planning to do? You know, destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. You know, so he begins to explain to Abraham what he was planning to do. And verse 21, he said, I have heard the cries of Sodom, verse 20, all their wickedness. And uh, we go down now, see whether they have done all together according to the outcry against it that has come to me. If not, I will know. 
Verse 23. Look at it. And Abraham came near and said, Will you also destroy the righteous with the wicked? Look at verse 22. And the men turned their faces from there and went towards Sodom, but Abraham stood yet before the Lord. He said the men now went to Sodom and Abraham and God stood there while Abraham started talking with him. How can you, the judge of the whole earth, do long? He started interceding for Sodom. Look at chapter 19 verse 1. Now, the two angels, everyone said the two angels, came to Sodom in the evening. So, okay, there were three people. Two of them moved to Sodom to destroy it. And they met Lot. They actually saved Lot because of Abraham. Look at chapter 19, the last verse. Uh, verse 29, I mean. Verse 29. P put it up. And it came to pass. Chapter 19, verse 21. Verse 29, I mean. And it came to pass that when God destroyed the cities of the plain, that God remembered Abraham and delivered Lot out of the midst of the overthrow. When he overthrew the cities in which Lord dwelt. So, two men went down and of course they destroyed the city of Sodom and Gomorrah. But one stood back and Abraham came near and began to talk with him. How can you destroy the righteous people? Now, put back John 1.18. If John 1.18 is correct. Who then did Abraham see? Who ate the food in his house? No man has seen God at any time. The only manifestation of God that has been from time immemorial has been the only begotten who has been in the bosom of the Father. John chapter 5. Let me show it to you. Let me show it to you. I think you need to see verse 37. And the Father himself that has sent me has borne witness of me. This is Jesus talking. He have neither heard his voice at any time nor seen his shape. You have neither heard his voice at any time, nor seen his shape. He's talking to the Jewish nation. And he said at any time, during the time of Moses, during the time of Elijah, all those times, you have neither heard his voice. What is going on here is that the one that brought Israel out of Egypt, that their Jehovah that they've been walking with, came in the flesh and they did not know him. That person they caught covenant with. Because Israel was a nation that God brought to himself by a covenant. He shed blood. And it was because of that. One day Abraham was bold enough to offer his son. So he gave his son. He came here in the flesh. And none of them recognized him. Just like here now. Many of you don't know him. And you come to church Sunday after Sunday. Read the Bible. You have a whole book written about him. You, you have movies. You have pastor. You have preachings. And yet you don't know who he is. The worst one is that the disciples he walked with didn't know who he was. The scripture said, if Satan has known, if he knew, he thought he was dealing with a human being. No? He said if he had known, he wouldn't have crucified the Lord of glory. Because the moment he tore the veil, which was the flesh, the real personality appeared with him in hell. That was when the man. And that's how he lost everything he collected from Adam. And all the control he had over humanity. He lost them in one night. And the reason why Jehovah had to come in the flesh. Is that to do this thing. The second turn. Second battle. And it will be just. He needed a man to do it. And yet the Bible said, he searched everywhere and found no one. So he decided to undertake the job by himself. So he told the prophet, tell them, give them a sign. It was a king that asked for a sign. God told him, I will heal you. 
I'll give you 15 more years. The guy said, I, I need a sign. He said, you want a sign? He said, yes. He said, okay. Prophet Isaiah, give him this sign. A sign he was giving had nothing to do with what the man was asking. He first gave him the sign, moving back the sun die forward or backward, he chose and they moved it and then he says, signify to these people that a virgin shall conceive and bring forth a son. And his name shall be called Emmanuel, which being interpreted God with us. So God was planning to come here in the flesh. Was planning to come here and actually live among men. If no man has seen God at any time, or even his ship, I want to ask you, then who was the fourth man in the burning bush? You remember when Nebuchadnezzar eh, made that order that everybody would worship him, um, the golden image. And he said, if you don't, we will throw you into a furnace of fire. And so Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego refused to do that. And so he ordered the furnace to be heated up seven more times. And after they did that, they said, okay. Carry them and throw them there. The Bible said, because the king's command was urgent. The strong men that lifted these men to go and throw them, the fire burned them to death. Now they carried them and threw them inside the fire. And the king had seed prepared. Let me see how you will survive this. Ah. <coughs> the king said, ah. He turned to some of his nobles. He said, look. I like King James. Some King James sometimes said, behold. He said to them, look. Ah. Did we not cast three men into the fire bound? How come now that there are four, three? Then he said, and the fourth one looks like the son of God. <laughs> Who is this Jesus that you've been talking about, evangelizing, even telling people what you don't know? When you finish, and maybe the family you have preached to, they are dying of tuberculosis or dying of HIV or dying of uh, any of this sickness. When you finish, you close the Bible. You say, uh, I now invite you to church on Sunday. What about the tobacco? You say, no, I, our pastor is a man of God. You need to be in service this Sunday. So you can meet our pastor. So what are you, woman of God? <laughs> or boy of God? What are you? Slave of God or what? <laughs> 